in the vein of the, uh, you know, ministry training workshop that we try to sometimes come back to that theme on, on Thursday nights. Um, I want to just teach this lesson. And the reason I had him read 1 Corinthians 2 is because we needed some Bible tonight. <laughs> but the, because that is a great passage of Scripture. And if you read back through that, you'll see what he's saying is that the key is that we are presenting God's wisdom, not man's wisdom, okay, when we preach. doesn't matter if we're preaching the gospel or what he says is, hey, we even speak the, uh, a bit of a mystery to those that are perfect, you know, and, and so, but it's all not the, the words of man, but it's the wisdom of God. And so a big part of knowing what we're going to preach whenever we preach a sermon is that we would seek God's will and what we're going to say, that we'd read the Bible, try to be true to the Word of God, and we pray, study, and, uh, you know, here's a key. Don't try to make a sermon difficult. There are some people that try to get too complicated in making the sermon. Now I'm talking to guys, a lot of people in this room have already presented sermons, and you do a great job. I don't know exactly what your method is in uh, coming up with how you're going to present the message, I've provided here, you, some of you might have been like, oh, he accidentally gave me his notes or something like that. I've provided also with that an a, a, a example of a sermon that I preached just yesterday. And when I was writing this sermon yet, yet for yesterday's message in Iola, I was thinking through what I was going to do today. Uh, well, I mean, I, I didn't just do it yesterday, but I'm just saying I was thinking through how I was going to preach this. Uh, and so I was kind of, as I'm studying for this message, I'm writing down here the points that I can give you on how to prepare a sermon, okay? So the title is Sermon Preparation Start to Finish, and there's no way we're going to get through all that today, so I just cut it off, and we're just going to talk about a couple points here. And the reason I'm doing this is because I've wanted to for some time. Probably the one of the most common questions I get in regards to my preaching is how do you decide what you're going to preach? You know, when you know what you're going to preach, how you decide what kind of message you're going to preach. These are important things. And I know when I went to Bible college, that's what I wanted to know. Like, how do I know how to do that? Once you show me how to do that, I can just, I can take it from there. <laughs> you know, just show me how to do that. And, uh, and anyway, so this is going to be a practical lesson uh, for those who want to know how to prepare a sermon. We got some, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping Brother Dean will be here. I know he's asked me about that. And if not, this will be a resource I can turn some people to uh, online to kind of help give some advice in this area. Hopefully it'll be helpful. Uh, it's a practical uh, sermon. For those who don't plan on preparing any sermon, you know, maybe you're a lady, you're like, I'm never going to preach, or maybe you're just not interested in doing that. That's fine. I don't think everybody has to do that by any means, but it might be beneficial still because you kind of know the process, you know, how your pastor comes up with the messages. And then if you're like, I'm just really super not interested, it's not spiritual, it doesn't have any verses, well, then just look at the example that I provided and just read that, okay? It's a good message from last night. <laughs> you get all the sermon, all the uh, uh, verses you want to read about alcohol, <laughs> all right? All right, so uh, uh, I've provided this uh, sample here, this example, and the purpose is to demonstrate how I've applied, personally, how I've applied uh, the steps that I'm going to show you. Um, you know, some of it still over time, it, uh, you know, it morphs a little bit. You add some things. Every once in a while, I'll still change something. You know, I've only been doing this for a, a fairly short time, but in the three years where I've been just like, as a pastor preparing, you know, several sermons a week. And then since we started this work, you know, add two more to that. And, and uh, you know, I've obviously come up with some ways, kind of a process and the different steps that I kind of go through to get it. And hopefully it'll, it'll help you uh, to understand this. Okay. So though this could help you begin to prepare for your sermons, you, this is your, where your bl first blanks are to fill in. You will have to find out what works best for you over time. I remember uh, as a Bible college student listening to Pastor Sam Davison preach, thinking, how does he go about preparing for that? How does he go about doing that? And I remember he, he never would give me, now I ended up having a homiletics class, which is studying of how to preach a sermon basically. And, uh, um, 
and I remember I, I ended up having a class where he was the teacher. But before that, I remember just trying to get a glimpse of what his notes look like and see how he does that. Because I just want to know, what is the process? How do you do that? I've got a Bible. When I first went to Bible college, uh, on the back, it has these different notes that I was writing down. And one note, one of the pages is I was watching him preach and I was thinking like, how, you know, how are some ways to keep people's attention? Because whenever I preach, you know, I had preached a couple of times just practicing, not, not knowing what I was doing. And I'm like, I put people to sleep. And so what is he doing? What's keeping him from put, keeping people to sleep? And I write down these little notes of things he's doing. It didn't all work. I still put people to sleep, but, but it was, I learned some little, I learned a couple tips here and there. No problem. Uh, over time, and I'm hoping I'm going to grow. I'm hoping I'm going to grow a whole lot more in my preaching. If I stop right now, I've failed. You know, I've got to get better and I've got to keep growing. But I'm in a position now where I'm, uh, people are hoping that I can impart something to them and I can help them get better. And so I'm going to do my best here to show you what my routine is. Now, I cheated actually by giving you this sample because my original plan was we were just going to create a mess, write a message from scratch. And I thought that would be so cool. But it's just not realistic because there's too much, too much studying that has to go into preparation. So what I could do in this format is I can tell you about some of the study and the preparation I did for this particular sermon. Knowing that I was going to be preaching this, I kind of uh, uh, thought about that I was going through this. Hope that makes sense. And this was by no means, this, pre this message on alcohol, no means some kind of wonderful example of a sermon. But the reality is when you're just, you know, have to preach sermon after sermon, write sermon after sermon, there's going to be a lot of, I don't want to say duds, but there's going to be a lot of just like, hey, I can't, this can't be my fancy message that, uh, you know, I, I've heard preachers call them a different, couple of different, like sugar stick or something like that. And for, for instance, Brother Sam Davison, right? He, even whenever he was our past, pastor, and, you know, I think he preached a lot of fresh messages, but he went and preached at conferences and stuff like that. And he had some go-to messages, which now as an evangelist, he travels around preaching and he uses a lot of these messages. I've heard some of his messages online and been like, hey, I heard him preach that message before. And if you talk to them, you remember when we went to the men's uh, uh, retreat, uh, recharge and they said, uh, uh, you know, one of the guys there, just their delivery and everything. It was like, how do you do that? And I remember we talked a little bit about that. And this one guy was just flat out honest and said, I've preached this probably like a dozen times. <laughs> and so eventually you kind of get cut some things out and you improve and you look, you don't have time to do that when you're just pulling out message after message after message. And I say pulling out, I don't pull out messages that I preached before. I'm always writing a new one. I think that's important to, to keep it fresh. And so it's going to take a lot of studying. It's going to take a lot of, you know, just taking risks sometimes. Like if anything, if you're, if you're a writer, if you're a professional writer, you write for a living, you ever heard of writer's block, you're right? There's these guys are like trying to figure out how do I keep this article just going out just regularly and producing. If you're an artist, the same thing, you know, but there's sometimes you just got to go take a, take a risk and just start and just kind of go with it. And, you know, if it doesn't work out, there's always <laughs> the next sermon. And that sounds terrible, but here, here's the key. I'm not trying to come up with some polished sermon that's going to impress people. The main thing that I want to do is open up the Word of God and say, hey, here's what the Bible says. Like, if you don't agree with me, at least you know where to find it. <laughs> at least you know how to study it. And here are some points to consider. All right. That's the, uh, the very least amount that I want to do. The, preferably, what I can do is preach a message that will prick your heart and it'll make you say, wow, I need to realize something I need to change in my life. And it'll cause you to, uh, uh, to change your behavior or whatever. But I'm not trying to make that happen. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to... You know, here, here's what I don't do, never do. There's this one person in the church that needs this message. And so I sit down and I'm like, well, I got to see if I can really convict this person. And if you ever feel like I've done that to you, it was an accident. <laughs> okay. And I remember being in uh, uh, this church, this guy just started coming. He was working on our bus route and uh, he was just newly saved. I mean, he was like so bad that when he first started coming to church, the workers that led him to the Lord had to go to his house and pull him out of his house high on weed. And they'd have to pull him out and say, hey, what are you doing, man? You need to get in church. And they'd pull him to church and, and all that stuff. This is how new he was. And then a little bit of time went by. He started working on the bus route and he cleaned up his life and he was learning how to sing songs and he was leading the children and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, obviously under supervision and everything. But he... Uh, 
uh, I remember one day he was on the bus and he looked at me and he said, I don't know how Brother Sam does it. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I don't know how he knows. He was dead serious. He wasn't joking. He was like, but he knows everything that I'm doing in my life. He said, like, I don't know if he's spying on me, asking people, or if God's just giving him some kind of revelation or something. But he said, he'll, he'll come and he'll be preaching and he'll stand right in front of me and he'll start talking about some kind of sin that I had done that week. And he was like, I don't understand how he does that. And I'm like, that's not Brother Sam. That's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you can't generate that. And I know uh, some things about Brother Sam's philosophy. He would never think, hey, I, this one person out of 2,000 in the church, <laughs> right? this one person really needs this message and write a message for that person. That's just not how it works. The idea is coming up with, hey, what does God want me to present to people? And I'll show you kind of some steps. The first thing is, again, most common question I get is, how do you choose what you're going to preach? Okay. So number one, choosing your topic or your text, et cetera, because I think you could probably put some other things there, your, your theme or whatever. <clears throat> and I've preached a message before on, on, on preaching, and uh, it was talking about different types of preaching, uh, expository preaching, topical preaching, textual preaching. I'm not going to get into all that right now, uh, but I might have to explain some of those words as we go through this. But how do you choose that? How do you know what topic you're going to preach on? If you're going to preach expository, how do you know what story you're going to preach from or what you know book of the Bible you're going to preach from? And so, you know, I'm only going to speak from my own experience here, uh, but here are some points, okay? First of all, when you set out to figure out what it is you're going to preach, you're picking a topic, right? Keep in mind that even after you pick that topic, you still don't know what the main point of this sermon is going to be. You still don't know how you're going to preach it. There's so much about it you don't know. All you've done is you picked a subject or you picked a chapter or you picked a... Now, how do you go about picking that? Uh, well, in my case, as a pastor, I'm going to tell you a <laughs> secret that makes it a whole lot easier. I preach series a lot of times. Okay, If you preach series, uh, then you at least know for a few messages the general place that you're going to be. It helps you to study. And even though I might not be prepared for the whole series, you know, after I preach one message, I've still got you know, time to study for the other messages uh, down the road as they come. So preaching a series or preaching through a book, which is, a, that would be a series too, but that's more what we call expository preaching. So I would say on Sunday mornings right now in Iola, we're going through Hebrews. And so I don't necessarily go chapter by chapter, although that's the way it's worked out so far, but I kind of just go by section by section. That seems like a finished thought. Let me preach on that thought or whatever. And as I'm reading through that, there are certain things that'll jump out to, uh, to me. And, uh, and this is how I decide, uh, what I'm going to preach. Let's see for me, a topic or a text for a singular sermon or for a series, you know, cause that you, even picking a series is going to start with the same process. It's typically chosen for one or more of the following reasons. Okay. Number one, and this is where you talk about the leading of the Holy Spirit. Some people go too far on this. You know, I've heard people, I've got two messages up with me right now, and I don't know yet which one I'm going to preach. I'm just waiting for God to show me. And like right before they get up, they're like, okay, the Holy Spirit said, maybe that happens to some people. That's not how I operate. <laughs> okay, I just, I'm going to do my best to come up with something, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just hope that I'm following a, a, and I'm being sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in doing that. And it's kind of like when we go knock on doors, like we can't really plan some of the experiences that God gives us. Like, you know, you, we didn't plan, we're just going to knock all the doors in the street. We didn't know that car was going to drive up and that person that was in that car is going to get saved. Right. And so we're just doing the best we can to, to, to do something for the Lord. He told us to go into all the world and preach. So we're going to go preach. We know what we're preaching. We know the message. And then God just leads us to the right people or he allows somebody to come by at the right time. There's a lot that the Holy Spirit is working on in people's lives that we don't really know. But as a pastor, when I'm getting a, hey, I need to preach something from God's word. Well, here's the reassuring part. You can preach anything from the Bible. And as long as you're giving them Bible and you're not messing it up or teaching false doctrine or something, it's good. <laughs> right? It's good. It's just kind of like... Kind of like feeding people. I mean, you could feed them a bad meal. They still got to eat, right? It might not have been the most, uh, you know, wonderfully cooked meal or something, but they still got to eat. And it's like that when you prepare a sermon, like you're, you're okay. Now, if you're as a, 
as a member of the church, or you're in the congregation and you're just listening, you're just like, oh man, another dud. Well, then you got to get your heart right. <laughs> right? <laughs> because I'm giving you the Bible, okay? So just try to, uh, uh, try to let the Holy Spirit work in your life. All right. But here are the different ways. It just so happens, sometimes I'm reading in my regular Bible reading, or maybe for some reason I just started reading another chapter of the Bible that's not part of my regular reading, or uh, there's lots of things that I'm reading at different times for different reasons. And sometimes something will just come up in my reading, or even in my life, a situation will come up, and it's just like everything in my heart and in my mind is, is about this certain subject. And this is why you'll find out a lot of times on Sundays, if you read, like I always put out like what my sermons are going to be. And if you read them, a lot of times, you know, maybe three out of those six are like dealing with the same subject in a way. That's because that's where my heart is and that's where my mind is. There's something that has caused me in my life and in my Bible reading and everything to be thinking about this certain subject. And I have found that if I'm just be sensitive to that and allow the Lord to use that, uh, I don't know why I'll be preaching that. But sometimes I'll preach it, and then afterwards somebody will come, and like that's exactly what I needed to hear, you know. And so that's where you want to be as a pastor. You want to, or as a preacher, you want to just be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, preach what He has for you to preach, and let the Holy Spirit do with it uh, whatever He will do with it. But how do you know what to preach? Well, God's going to put something on your heart. And well, everyone that's preached a message here, you've been through that process of trying to figure out. Maybe at first you tried to grab some things. Hey, this would be cool. I should talk about this. This would be a neat thing to talk about. And you just can't get peace about preaching any of those things. And then all of a sudden, it's, God's just like, boom, this is what I want. And sometimes you don't feel that, but sometimes you do. And so you're like, well, I'm just going to preach this. Now, you don't know how you're going to preach yet. You don't know what your sermon is going to look like, what style you're going to preach. All you know is I've got a topic. I've got a theme. I've got something on my heart that I need to get out. Super important, right? Jeremiah, remember Jeremiah says, you know, I wanted to be quiet. I wanted to keep my mouth shut, but I couldn't. There was like a fire in my bones. I'm paraphrasing, of course. And he's like, and I could not shut up, right? That's where you want to be as a preacher. There's something in it. I have to say it, you know? And some of my uh, probably most passionate sermons have been about lordship salvation. In a time where people were accusing me of easy believism and you're sending people to hell and all that, and there's something passionate about that. Like, I want people to know. I want people to know. And so I start studying that, and, and maybe a certain verse will come up in my mind, and it's on my heart. If it's in your heart, it's going to come out a lot stronger, more passionate, you know, which is not always, not every message is going to be that way. But All right, so that's typically how it'll happen. Sometimes a person will ask me a question. A lot of sermons I've preached here, somebody just said, hey, what do you think about this verse? And I'm like, you know what, I need to go study that a little bit more. And in my studying, I find some nugget or something that I'm just like, wow, I need to share this uh, with people. So that's another way that I often <clears throat> choose a topic. Uh, also, a special day coming up, obviously. We just recently had Mother's Day. Um, my mind will be thinking, you know, for that couple weeks prior to, hey, I know Mother's Day is coming up. You know, maybe God will just put something on my heart and I'll just be thinking, what am I going to preach for Mother's Day? Now, there are sometimes if I'm in a series and a special day comes up, I'll first look at what it is I was going to preach, go over that, kind of start refreshing my mind, um, studying some points or whatever, and see. Sometimes I'll decide I'm just going to go with what was already scheduled to preach. And you never know how that, you know, you know it's kind of like God set this up a long time ago or whatever, but sometimes it falls right in line with what the, that special day is. And you didn't even have to force it. You know what I mean? It just it was just right there. Always uh, good uh, around Easter time, that's what happened. I was going through uh, the words of Christ and we we're looking through the book of Luke everywhere where God uh, or Jesus spoke, you know, kind of like if you had the red letter edition, they'd be red words. And, and, uh, and I wanted to look at those and say, why did he say that? And look throughout the Bible and that that was what the whole series was. I didn't know where it was going to end, but you know, right around Easter time, I realized, you know what, that's only three weeks away. Let me see here. It's, that's where I'm going to be. I'm going to be talking about, you know, the, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. And so anyway, uh, these are different ways that, it would happen. So let me get up to speed now with your example, your sample uh, message here. And I'm probably, I'm sure there's a bunch of mistakes. Here's now the, now I'm getting nervous. <laughs> like, oh, wait a minute. They're reading my personal stuff. My wife always tries to get a glimpse of my notes. 
not all, I don't know, but always, but she'll be looking over my shoulder to see, and I'm like, don't look at it. I'm going to preach it. You just, you just show up and listen to me preach it. It's like my personal notes here, okay? But I knew I was going to share them with you, so, uh, you know, any kind of weird notes that I, scribbles I would have made, I, I left those out. But I'm sure there's typos. Okay, how did I pick this? And I just, is there somebody in the church that has struggled with alcohol? You know what? There was that day. Last night, somebody, somebody came that I personally know. Uh, he's not a member of the church, hadn't been coming very, very often. Uh, but another friend brought him who knows his situation. And it just so happened I'm preaching a message that I know deals with that person. But I had no idea they were going to be there when I was putting the message together. Now, sometimes as a preacher, you got you to gotta just deal with the emotions of, you know, do, do I hesitate? And, you know, should I not say it this way because that person might get offended or I mean you didn't have, you're not preaching to that person you weren't intending to do that you're just preaching what the bible says but you know that what you say is going to affect somebody in there you have to just say it anyway you have to cuz god I mean in fact more so I would think if you know hey god brought that person here I didn't know he was going to be here but he brought me I was definitely not going to take anything out of the message cuz god probably wanted him to hear it and so then it's just a matter of just calming your nerves and not being affected by that and just going ahead and preaching what God uh, has for you to preach. Okay, so how did I come about preaching on alcohol? This is another one of those topics I don't necessarily like preaching about. It's not a hobby horse, but I did preach about it whenever I preached on Independent Baptist Hobby Horses not that long ago. <laughs> the topic came up. I did preach about it uh, at least one other time uh, in Iola, uh, in the last couple of years and, and probably two, three times, it comes up, you know, different messages. I, I, there was nothing inside me that said, you know what, you need to preach a, a message on alcohol. Here's how I came up with it, okay? I'm going through a series on Wednesday nights on the commandments of God. And when I started the series, here was my thinking. We need, and I don't, again, I don't remember how I picked that, but it was, it was this kind of a process. There was something that led me to picking that subject of just all the commandments in the Bible, specifically Old Testament commandments, and let's just look at them. And so in my mind, I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we got the 10 commandments. Those are like kind of categories. And Jesus put all those categories in two categories. Love thy Lord, thy God with all thy heart. Love thy neighbor as thyself. In my mind, I'm thinking like on a computer, you got files. Right. So you got like this, you open up this file, it's the commandments of God and you click on that. And then there's two folders. Everybody following me. <laughs> I couldn't explain this very easily in Iola. <laughs> not, not, not everybody in there uses uh, computers. And you got these two, f f these two files and one has to deal with the commandments about toward, you know, our relationship with God and the other is our relationship with man. And so in those files, you got five, the first five deal with God, the second five deal with man. And then you could go to all those, and then there's other commandments. You know, what I mean? that's kind of how my mind was seeing this, but I had no idea where the series was going to go. So we went through the Ten Commandments, got through those in a different order. We started with, uh, you know, the, the ones dealing with mankind, because those are the more common uh, laws that we have in the Bible, and then with God. And, and anyway, so after I got done with that, I said, okay, what about some ceremonial type commands that are in there. And I'm reading through that. I had already seen a whole bunch of them and said, I know I'm going to have to deal with the Sabbath day because that's one of the Ten Commandments. And so that will save that. And then that'll lead me into other ceremonial laws. And there's a whole bunch that I haven't even touched yet. Uh, so then I just started kind of picking out these different commands in the Bible that people are like, was well, that really a sin to do that? Or is that really the... And I just felt like the subject of alcohol came up. And so I just started studying verses on alcohol, and I was like, I think I'm going to preach on that. I didn't have any more than that. That's just a topic, and that's how I started uh, to get this. So I just named it Commandments of God Regarding Alcohol. Now, if you look at this uh, second part, all right, after you choose a topic, remember, we still don't really know how we're going to preach this necessarily, uh, any of the points that we're going to make from it. But now we're going to come up with those main points of the sermon and a potential title, potential title, okay, subject to change, of course. I've changed my, sometimes I change my title the night before I preach it. And then, you know, Braden's putting on the live stream what the title of the message is because it's in the bulletin. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not right. <laughs> okay. Uh, but usually it's pretty close because it's just a generic title 
that helps me remember, hey, this is pretty much what my main point is, okay? And so I'm putting that, and that just helps me categorize that. My deadline for this, I think I wrote this in there, that my personal deadline for this is, is Thursdays, right? So when I'm coming here preaching, in my mind, I'm like, I already have to have my title, you know, my subject, maybe even have done a little bit of, of research and looking at some of the verses and everything for all my sermons next week. So Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, I leave one out, all has to be uh, okay, Sunday morning, Sunday uh, Sunday Kansas City, and then Sunday night. Anyway, there's six sermons. I got to have all those done by Thursday, okay? And so you see how, how this goes. All I knew was the commandments of God regarding alcohol, and I had a basic idea, uh, you know, of, of the subject. Now, here's what helps. Years of experience, years of reading your Bible, years of hearing preaching, you already know a lot of verses about not drinking alcohol, all right? But that's not good enough. All right, because you could have learned things wrong, incorrectly. You could have learned, uh, you know, the hobby horse thing. You know, you could be quoting some of those verses out of context. There's a whole lot more study that needs to be done. All right, if all you do is say, hey, that'd be a great subject because I like this verse and this verse and this verse. And so you preach a message based on those verses that you like. And sometimes we do that because of the lack of time or whatever. But that's probably not going to be a good enough study. All right, so here's what I do. In order to get to this point of preparing your sermon, you have got to do a lot of study, a lot of reading, a lot of praying, hopefully, and uh, comparing Scripture to Scripture. Here's another thing people don't necessarily think about, but you've got to study a lot of the common secular views that are out there. Okay, secular is your blank there. You say, well, why would you have to study that? Well, because you're dealing with people who live in a secular world many times. So you have to know what that is. And there's a lot of example from the Apostle Paul, by the way, where Paul goes into a region and he's going to preach to these people. He knows what their philosophers teach. He knows quotes that they are used to quoting. Uh, he's not the only one, but he's the first one to pop in my mind. So it helps to know some secular, have some secular wisdom. And this is what was hard for me as a pastor because I was a bad student. <laughs> Listen up, young people. You think that God might ever use you in the ministry. Start making sure that you study and pay attention right now to all studies, history, science, math. It's all going to come. God's going to use any knowledge you have. God can use that in down the road and something. You know, somehow he can use any knowledge that you have. All right. So since I don't know a lot of those things, if I'm going to preach a message and the message is on something science, you know, and I'm going to bring up a point that is scientific or whatever. I'm going to have to study, all right, what is the secular view? This is how I learned what evolution even actually teaches. Because when I first started preaching to teens, I realized this is what they're being taught in school. I don't even know what they're being taught. I was way wrong, way off on what I believe that uh, evolutionists taught. So I started studying, uh, read a lot of, uh, of uh uh, science books and, and sites online. And, and obviously I was trying to balance that out with some Christian views and most importantly, uh, the Bible. But that's, this, is, this is all part of that study and figuring out how I'm going to take that topic that I feel like God's put on my heart or allowed me to, uh, to come up with. How am I going to put that on paper and present it in a sermon? Well, the first thing you're going to have to do is lots of study, reading, uh, thinking on that, that topic. Just a, uh, uh, another little tip. There's a lot of things that I do because a lot of people are like, man, you're preaching all this time and you're going here and you're doing this. How do you have time to do some of the things that you do? All right. For instance, how do you have time to go running and study? Well, here's what I do. I study while I'm running, <laughs> right? If I'm running, you know, I might be listening to some audio Bible or listening to, you know, maybe, uh, maybe some different sermons. Uh, you know, obviously that's not how, the best way to prepare a message is stealing someone else's ideas, but sometimes it helps. Uh, I wouldn't want to, uh, uh, man, I hope I'm not getting too many rabbit trails here, but here's what I don't want to do as a preacher is I don't want to say, okay, I'm preaching on the tribulation. Let me see what so-and-so says on the tribulation. I don't want to do that. Okay. Because that's going to skew your view whenever you're studying, you're looking for what that person said. So if I know there's another preacher that I listen to, uh, there's like th three preachers that I listen to quite regularly, and, uh, and they all are, are quite a bit different from each other. And 
if I know that somebody taught on a certain subject, or maybe I'm preaching through Hebrews, maybe I'm like, hey, I remember so-and-so pre preached on Hebrews a while back. I won't listen to their sermons on the book of Hebrews while I'm preaching on Hebrews. Does that make sense? So what I'll do is I'll listen to a message. I don't even know how to explain this, but that will be talking about maybe a story, right? And that story is part of one of the things that I'm studying uh, for that topic. I, I don't know if this makes any sense to you, but but I won't listen to a direct message on a certain topic and then preach what that preacher said. Okay, that's dangerous, right? I wouldn't even recommend anyone do that, even though you're part of this church and I'm your pastor. I wouldn't just take another sermon that I preached and divide that. And, you know, theoretically, there's, I guess, not anything necessarily wrong with that, you know, because you know you're preaching what your pastor uh, wants to preach. But let God speak to you. Let God help you to develop this sermon, okay? So, after we've done all that, here's what naturally happens, at least in my mind. I can't speak for everybody. In my mind, I've always liked simplifying things. How many of you guys like doing puzzles? Like problem solving or like uh, actual puzzles? Like, you know, there's all kinds of uh, Rubik's Cube. No, that's different. That's You got to memorize a lot of uh, formulas and stuff. For that. <laughs> okay. I like puzzles. I like figuring out puzzles. And sometimes to figure out a puzzle, or here's an example, okay? Some kids in here can relate to this. Legos or something like that, all right? If you buy a box, and on the picture you see, hey, this is what it's supposed to look like, but all you know is you've got all these parts. You might have a certain way of laying those all out, right? I'm going to take them all, and I'm going to lay them all out so that they're easy to find or whatever. That's kind of what's going on in my mind when I'm preparing for a message, okay? I've got this topic, I don't actually have the picture. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I have this topic and I'm trying to lay out all the parts and see whatever, what I've got. Okay. So here's what this looks like. This is, this will get kind of crazy sometimes. All right. And this is so much better, so much better than going to a commentary or re-preaching somebody else's notes or something like that. That's, that's going to be very shallow. This is so much better. All right. You're going to find, for instance, if the topic a certain topic, right? So you're going to look at a word or a phrase or something that has to deal with that topic. You're going to look up every time the Bible says that word or topic. Sometimes that's like too unrealistic because there's like thousands of times, you know, and so maybe you have to eliminate a few things or simplify it a little bit. But do you understand what I'm saying? Like, so now you have a bird's eye view of all the places in the Bible where it talks about a certain subject. Not all the play, but the best that you can find. You can lay all these things out there in your mind, right? These are all the verses. And so what I do is I literally, uh, on the sermon, you know, I, I've got a, a, a generic title that could be the title, Subject to Change. Uh, and I always write introduction. I haven't written my introduction yet, but I just write that. I'm, I'm laying out all my points. I literally copy and paste, uh, and I'm going to get to this in a minute, all the verses that I can find in the Bible that, that deal with that subject. And I'll have them all there on, on my paper, okay? Now, here are some resources that you can use. Obviously, the Internet provides a lot of resources for this, online Bible programs. But you obviously want to be careful, okay? The world presents all kinds of things in the name of bi being a Bible or... Uh, or being, you know, a commentary or whatever that's going to provide you all kind of, of garbage. Now, I use a source called Online Bible, and it's old, it's free, it's, uh, it's not very complicated, but it's very similar to, look at B right there, concordances, okay? It's very similar to a Strong's Concordance. Now, let me stop right there, okay? Okay. <clears throat> What is the benefit of a Strong's Concordance? Do you know what a Strong... Have you ever seen an actual Strong's Concordance? I mean, they're like this thick. All right. Now, recently, somebody made the mistake of relying so much on their Strong's Concordance. Some of you guys know who I'm talking about. That they preached a point. They made a point, and they preached on this subject using the Strong's Concordance. Well, I don't remember what it was. They called it something else. And they really butchered it. And so some people started posting, uh, you know, like memes about it and stuff like that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If not, that's all right. Not important. <clears throat> Strong's concordance is dangerous. And I'll tell you why. Because if you think I can click on a couple Strong's numbers, get the Greek definition or how many times the that, that word is used in the Bible or whatever, and then just think, oh, now I know exactly what the translators meant by this. 
right? You don't. <laughs> you don't. But I would say that it's foolish to say that that resource is not helpful because the Strong's Concordance, or any concordance, really, there's a lot of different people who have taken a lot of time to go through every word in the, in the King James Bible, and Strong's is all based on the King James Bible. Now, I don't know what his source was for his, uh, for his Greek and Hebrew, uh, the Texas Receptus. I don't know. I have no, I have no clue. <clears throat> all right, but here's what I know, that I can go on the Strong's Concordance and I can say, you know what? Where does the Bible talk about alcohol? Well, the word alcohol is not in the Bible, but wine is, drunk is, uh, you know, strong drink is. And what I can do is I can find in a concordance, I can look up that word, and it's going to tell me uh, all the places in the Bible where that word is used. Now, I don't use the Strong's Concordance. I have two or three of them on my shelves. I go online on the online program. It's, a, it's very simple. I put in the search engine the word, boom, it all comes up. So I don't have to go searching for that. It saves a whole lot of time. And it's going to take me to all of those verses. Now, I'm not interested in going back to the Greek and the Hebrew and all that kind of stuff. But what I have done is I've now made it really easy to just copy and paste. And I've got all those verses on uh, my notes that deal with those subjects. And so I'm going to skim through all those. I'm going to start deleting the ones that don't apply. All right. For instance, if it's talking about wine being a blessing and, the, uh, and all this kind of stuff, then I'm thinking, all right. It's not talking about alcoholic wine, right? I'm probably not going to preach that. However, in this case, I did because I realized, hey, we need to know something about that. We need to know that the Bible talks about wine. It's not always, always alcoholic, okay? And so uh, anyway, in the process of time, I was able to take all of these things, uh, divide them up a little bit. Like these, these all kind of follow in the same category. These are talking about wine being a blessing or wine and oil. Why is that important? Because it's, a, it's the same process. You get wine from squeezing a grape. You get oil from squeezing an olive, all right? It's the same process. That's going to be important to, for people to know that wine's not alcoholic. Wine is just the fruit of the juice, okay? And so I'm keeping all those and I'm separating them into sections, all right? You're in Legos. Now you're putting all the little two-piece, I don't know what they're called, two you're putting all those together. One of you kids know, I'm sure. Uh, all the four by fours, you're going to put all those together. All the six by sixes, no, three by threes, you know, you know what I'm saying. If you've ever played with Legos, you're organizing them. You're making it easier for you uh, down the line. <clears throat> okay, and so while I'm skimming through these, like I said, I realized, hey, there's a lot in the Bible about wine being a blessing. I've already mentioned that a couple of times. Uh, there's a lot in the Bible about, you know, where, where it's kind of like, you know, they just, it was a social drink. So I thought in my mind, hey, well, that's what the world thinks today about alcohol. It's a social drink, right? And so this kind of ended up being my introduction, uh, but only after, you don't have an introduction until you know what you're going to preach. And so only after I realized uh, some of these verses got them separated in my mind, I began to have an introduction. And in my introduction, I just asked the question, Hey, here's what people want to know. Is drinking alcohol a sin? You know, show me the specific command in the Bible where God says it's a sin. These are the kind of things people ask. And if you're talking about the commandments of God regarding alcohol, this is what they want to know. Is God actually command me not to drink alcohol? And so, uh, and so the consensus that I came up with in reading all this is, you know what? I do believe the Bible, in, in the Bible, God gives some strong commands about not drinking alcohol, okay? And, and I had in my mind where I was going with this, but basically he does. But you know what? Some of them are, aren't necessarily commands, but they're kind of like, you know, he that does this is not wise. You know, he, there's kind of like wisdom, suggestion. And so my kind of my line that I came up with in my introduction, like this is going to be the basis of my sermon, is we don't necessarily have to see a direct command from God, not uh, a command from God not to do something foolish in order for it to be considered a sin. Okay, and I use a couple of examples: uh, polygamy. Polygamy in the Bible, we see men of God who had more than one wife. I don't see where there was a direct command. Now you could go to 
Genesis where he says, you know, uh, the husband shall leave his mother, a uh, man shall leave his mother and father, cling to his wife. They two shall be one flesh. There's no room in there for multiple wives and everything. You could kind of read between the lines and say, well, it seems to be suggested, you know. But then I thought in my mind, and this is what I'm thinking about while I'm preparing this, thought in my mind, but wait a minute, you know, uh, all the examples in the Bible where people were involved in polygamy ended up pretty disastrous. I said, well, that would be a neat thing to do. What about the examples in the Bible where drinking alcohol ended up disastrous, right? And so I've already got all my verses there that are lined out. What's the very first in the first verse in the, I mean, the place in the Bible that talks about wine? Noah. He got drunk. And Ham looked upon his nakedness, and he ended up getting cursed and all this kind of stuff. And you're like, wow, the very first, nah, there's a there's this rule, some people call the law of first mentions where they say, hey, the first time something's written in the Bible, God put that there. I think that's a pretty dogmatic statement to say, God absolutely put that there the first time so that you could he could teach you something. I don't necessarily believe that's true. Like there's some kind of mystical, you know, hey, the first time it's used, it tells us exactly what it means or something. But when you're going through the Bible and you're like, hey, when's the first time that's, that's mentioned? It is interesting to see how many times you're just like, that pretty much sets the standard. If you're just starting from Genesis and you just start reading your Bible, the first time you dealt with that subject, you know, it gives you a pretty good clue about what's going to happen for the rest of the Bible. So I started thinking about that. And so you can see it ended up in my notes. Consider some biblical examples here, a little, uh, little ways. <clears throat> and, uh, and again, I pulled out some of these thoughts from all those parts that are laid out. Okay. And I put, uh, you know, I noticed alcohol in our society versus alcohol in the Bible. Look down at the highlighted words down there. I noticed some places the Bible calls it the fruit of the vine or new wine or where Pharaoh said, I took the grapes and I pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. You know, these are not talking about alcoholic wine. And so I'm slowly eliminating some of those verses from my long list of verses and, and pulling those out and they're fitting into, hey, now I've got some examples. Noah, you got Lot's uh, daughters get him drunk and try to have, see, you know, have continue his seed with them, Genesis 19. You got Hannah who is, she's just praying and Eli sees her stammering with her lips and nothing's coming out because she's, the Bible says she's praying in her heart. And he says, what are you, you know, what are you drunk? Get out of here, you know, stop being drunk. And so he's obviously, her being under the influence was a bad thing. And he's saying that. And then she goes on in that story to say, don't count me as one of the daughters of Belial. You know what that means? That's saying like, hey, what do you think? I'm like a child of the devil. <laughs> I don't drink. I'm not drunk. That tells you that, hey, there was a type of person who drank alcohol where that was considered a very bad thing that you would say, I'm not a child of the devil, right? And so, uh, and so that was an example. The death of Nabal, we just recently preached on that. And he was drunk in that right before he ended up dying. Uh, and so I'm able to pull all these verses out and put them into uh, these different places you might notice in this sermon here, my introductions often, because all my studying ends up becoming introductory thoughts, <laughs> and then my points are really short. I'm not saying you need to do that by any means, uh, but that's just usually what ends up happening. So I've set everything up, and now I'm like, i got to get through the, the points really fast. Okay, but uh, I, all these things I'm pulling out of just comparing Scripture to Scripture. I haven't read a bunch of commentaries. I haven't read, uh, you know, went back to the Greek and to the Hebrew. I'm just, I'm dealing with English. And so I'm going to see all the times in the English that these, this word or this subject is, is mentioned. And I came up with this idea uh, that, well, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't need to tell you why, how I preached that message exactly. Let's go uh, with our notes here. Much like putting together, uh, let me see here. Uh, so we talked about internet and the Bible programs, concordances. Remember, we're just laying all these out. Now, notice this uh, C here. Use your memory as much as you can. And I talked about how you're not going to rely just on your memory. You're going to have to do some studying. But use your memory as much as you can. Here's why I say that. There were some places in here, for instance, I took the grapes and I pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. I'm not going to find that by looking up wine or strong drink. You know what I mean? But there's some things in your head you just remember. 
And maybe the Lord will place it on your heart as you're, as you're preparing the message. But you just remember that. And I remember that. I remembered that verse, you know, woe unto him that giveth his neighbor to drink. Well, I hadn't looked up the word drink. I just had, you know, drunk and, and wine and strong drink, all these kind of things. But in my mind, I'm thinking, well, where's that one verse? And then I go find it. So this is why it's so important. And this is why people say, hey, don't even think about being a, a pastor or preaching or, or, you know, going into full-time ministry as a preacher of God's word if you don't have a pretty good familiarity with the Bible. <laughs> Quite honestly, there are times I'm like, I was not ready to be a pastor in this area. And now I've been reading my Bible since I was a little kid, but I don't feel like I had a grasp on it like I should. And I had memorized as much as I should until I had to really start preaching and I had to really start relearning some things and memorizing some things. And I'm still trying to learn them. I'm still trying to get better at that. But look, there are guys out there that that have so much more of the Bible memorized. There's guys in this room that are really good at memorizing Scripture. That's going to help you tremendously. Don't ever stop learning the Bible, reading it, studying it, meditating on it, quoting it. That's going to help you uh, prepare sermons a, a whole lot. All right, let, real quickly. Much like putting together a puzzle after you lay out all the parts, in this case, Bible verses that contain words, related words or phrases, uh, you systematically put things into proper places. I already talked about eliminate uh, unnecessary verses that don't relate to your topic. Categorize the remaining verses into related groups. Reduce those groups down to a few main points of your sermon. Sometimes I hate, hate it, but for the sake of time, I've got to cut out a lot of scripture because they're just not significant enough for me to put in that time frame that I have. You know what I mean? Like they're good verses, but they're not significant enough. So I have to reduce a whole lot of those. All right. Uh, now, if that's not hard enough, <laughs> all right, some of you are like, I'm never going to, I'm never going to preach. Okay. It's really, it's, it's an amazing opportunity. And what did Paul say? Covet prophecy, right? That's a greater gift. If don't be, don't think like, I'm never going to want to do that. You don't have to do that. And, and I, and I, I think it'd be wrong if everybody was like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm called to be a preacher, but you should covet that. You should say, man, that's the one thing I'd want to do is be able to explain God's word and teach people God's word. I think that's everyone should want to do that. Okay, but what I'm telling you is it's not, not all that easy, <laughs> okay, to do that. So now let's say you've got all these verses lined up, all the verses in the Bible where it talks about these things, and you've narrowed it down a little bit. You've got rid of some things. you got one big problem. You don't know the context necessarily to all of those verses, so you could just go through and start quoting verses, but you don't know the whole context. And I can't tell you how many times I've gotten myself into trouble because I'm just like, hey, this is a great verse and I've quoted it. And later on, when I'm studying that chapter, I'm like, that's not even what that verse meant. And I just pulled it out and used it. So now you've got to know a little bit about the context of each of these verses that you're going to use so that you don't say something stupid when you get up there and start putting it, the story in the wrong time place in the Bible. I've done it several times, all right? It's embarrassing. Thankfully, not people aren't really listening to everything you say, and they probably don't catch it. <laughs> How many of y'all listen to everything I've said so far, and you just got it? It's 10% at best. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, all right. So a basic understanding of the context of each of these verses will be essential. Obviously, this can be very time-consuming, as your blanks there. Time-consuming. But actually, quite honestly, this is why... This is why so many pastors who are bivocational can't wait for the day that they're full-time in ministry. And when I became a pastor and people looked at the size of our church, I can't tell you how many pastors were like, wait a minute, do you work another job? And I'd be like, yeah, I mean, I got like a little office that I clean or whatever, but I'm full-time. And they'd be like, man, I wish I was full-time. Now, look, a pastor should be willing to go out and work 40 hours and pastor for 60 hours, <laughs> whatever a pastoring day, you know, they ain't even willing to do that if they have to do that. But I can't tell you that how wonderful the advantage is to have extra time. Look, I mean, they can't spend hundred percent of their time studying. You'd go crazy probably if you did, but you do have a whole lot more time than the average person. And I'm telling you what is lacking in a lot of preaching in my own preaching, sometimes just because I got so much going on is taking the time I mean, it's time consuming, taking the time to know what do all these verses say, 
you know, where does the Bible, you know, where are the cross references to this? It's time consuming, okay? Even when you think that you can remember the context of something, you still need to look it up because you could be wrong and uh, not remember that right or it was taught wrong to you, uh, incorrectly to you. There's a lot of studying that goes into it. All right, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes one story or text will give you all the main points that you need for the sermon. So, so here's what happened. I, I looked through the Bible at all the places that it talked about alcohol and all these. Of all those verses, this one chapter just tells me every chapter. This is the the place in the Bible to go to that says don't drink alcohol. And I could just decide, you know what, I'm just going to preach a message from that text. And now I've narrowed down what the message is going to look like. It's going to be an expository type message from that text. You say, oh, well, then you wasted your time studying all those other places. No, you didn't. Because when you're preaching through a story expositorily, you're going to back up all your points with, hey, it's not just in this story. The Bible says this and this and this. So you still need to know all those things. Even, no matter how you decide to preach, okay? So, uh, but sometimes you will narrow it down and say, okay, now I know. It's going to be, it's not just a topical message, points pulled out from all over the Bible, but it's just this one story, and I'm going to preach an expository message. <laughs> all right? Where did I leave off here? C. No, I already said that. So, number one there, while studying a topic, in the way that I described above, laying everything out, pulling out all those verses and studying the context, you might decide the best approach is to focus on one story and preach more of an expository message that deals with the topic you have studied. Even if you focus on one story, the studying of the topic throughout the whole Bible is going to help you back, uh, back your points up with the Scripture. I already mentioned that. <clears throat> I try not to ever preach a message because sometimes you'll find this one verse, you're like, oh man, that says exactly what I want to say. And you'll start preaching that message and you're like, here's point one, point two, point three. But point two is kind of iffy. Like, is that really what the Bible says? So I, I've got this. <laughs> there's been a couple times where I've done it, but I usually preface it by saying, now, look, I don't know 100 percent sure if I'm right on this. And I'll say that. And you're like, oh, you should never say that. Yeah, I'm going to say that because if I'm going to preach it and I honestly can't tell you that I know that it's right, I don't want to be teaching you incorrectly. Right, you're believing a false doctrine or something like that, but here's what: nine times out of ten, or even more than that, I'm not going to preach a story and just pull out this point and then just make this point if I can't back it up from other scripture. Okay, I want to at least say, even if I'm wrong, if that's not what this text means, I can show you a bunch of verses from the Bible that backs that up, so that I know that that point is right, even though it's not here in the text that I'm preaching. Does that make sense? I've done that lots of times. Many false teaching comes from taking one story and drawing something from that passage that you see, but it uh, isn't necessarily the point God intended to be there. I could just go down a list right now of all these times that people have preached something. I'm like, you got that from this one story. You know, you, you really can't prove that from here. You need to be, at least be able to back that up with some other uh, verses. Now you will have a better clue how you're going to preach the sermon, what the main point is going to be. Now let me explain that real fast. Okay, so you, usually a sermon has multiple points, right? But really, here's how you should think about this. Again, remember what I said about choosing a, a generic title? You should be thinking in your mind, right whenever you're pre preparing the sermon, I want this whole message to have one major point, Okay. Uh, some people call it the central idea, you know, and that's usually expository. Though it's, what's the central idea of this text? Okay, uh, the I want this one this one point that I'm making about this subject. Okay, and in this case, what my main point was going to be, or it became, is you know, even if even if the commandments of God regarding alcohol aren't super clear, God said, "Thou shalt not do whatever." And there's plenty of verses that where He tells certain groups not to do it, or it makes a general commandment. Uh, but even if he didn't, you know, we could know, know by what we see in the Bible about alcohol that it's not something wise. It's not something that we should do. I mean, that's the basic. Now I got to figure out how to put that into one sentence. And then maybe that sentence uh, is going to take several different ways to say that those become my sub points. Does that make sense? But we're going to learn all about that 
Lord willing, I was kind of like up in the air. Should I do a part two of this? We'll see. Okay. But if it's helpful, if I get a little bit of feedback and it's helpful, we'll go through the rest of this. Because the title of the message is Sermon Preparation Start to Finish. Okay. So I think we should finish this thing, <laughs> All right, but not tonight. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'll help us uh, as students of your word and many in here uh, have a desire to preach and to uh, present your word. Uh, in some manner or another. And Lord, I certainly appreciate those who preach and the blessing they've been both here and in Iola. Uh, and I pray that you just help all of all of us interested in preparing sermons, Lord, to just know some tips and, and understand some methods by which we can do that, that we would be able to clear, clearly present your word and, and help us to know that it's, it's all uh, the demonstration of the Spirit and pointing people to your word that we want to accomplish and not trying to give our own wisdom and our own uh, exciting words and, and all that. Um, but Lord, I pray you give wisdom, help me as I try to help people with that. And for all those here that are not interested in that or won't ever be preaching a message, I pray that you'll help them get something from this, uh, this message tonight. Pray you be glorified. Thank you for this church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.